What if I told you, you could go from zero experience in tech to becoming a network architect? And not just any architect, but a principal network architect for one of the most iconic companies in the world. Well, in today's episode, I sit down with Donald Robb, who is a principal network architect at the Walt Disney Company, who did exactly just that. His journey was full of unexpected twists, lessons learned the hard way, and strategies that you won't find in any textbook. If you ever wondered how someone can go from ground zero to the top of the networking world, buckle up because Donald's story is going to change the way you think about your own career path. So with that said, let's dive into this week's episode. My name is Donald Robb. I've noticed that Packet for Forward Online. Uh, I am Disney's lead architect on the studio side, which is all the uh, film studios like your Marvels and your Lucas's, all that stuff. Uh, I also do content creation for INE. I make their DevNet courses and uh, I'm an author of about eight Cisco books now. Nice. That's so cool. And thank you for taking the time here at Cisco Live, which I know is, can be a little crazy and busy. Just yeah. a little. <laughs> Just a little bit. But, um, you know, do you mind sharing like your origin story, like how you got started in the field? Uh, yeah, actually I got a pretty unique one. Huh. So uh, when I was young, I was a carpenter's apprentice under my dad. And uh, we basically were a Scottish genealogy company that uh, basically did like, uh, looked up your last name, gave the, uh, and then sold your shirt, like uh, pressed on it, that kind of stuff. Oh, cool. Uh, and my dad was fairly forward thinking, so he, um, had a website in the 90s, which was relatively rare. And um, uh, one day, uh, our webmaster comes into our small town holding like a floppy disk and basically says, pay me money or I'll destroy your website kind of thing. And uh, my dad, being the nice, rational, ex-Special Forces person, ran him out of town. Um, <laughs> and then he basically walked into my room and uh, threw an HTML book at me and said, learn it. Nice. You'll probably still see the mark. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, from there, I uh, uh, took over like the web duties, and eventually we graduated or started doing other technologies. And, uh, and one day, I uh, forgot my lunch uh, for school, and uh, there was a college advertising a Cisco course. So I figured, hey, they got pizza, and uh, set me on the path. Nice. You know, it's a typical story. Everyone has that one. No, absolutely, and uh, that's a that's a funny story, and like. I think somewhat relatable still for some people, you know, um, I think a lot of people don't really have this field necessarily in mind when they first started out. I think a lot of people fall into it and like the deeper they go down the rabbit hole, the more they enjoy it and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. You got to have passion for this stuff because uh, if you're giving up your uh, weekends and whatnot to learn how a phone rings. Uh, uh, you got to enjoy that or uh, you're not going to like what you're doing. Absolutely. Do you mind, and I know you probably can't go into too many details, but share like a little bit more about what you do currently. Yeah, so I'm the uh, principal network architect for uh, Disney Studios, which uh, basically means I essentially run the architecture team and uh, uh, basically act as a team lead for them. Uh, so uh, basically our focus is uh, to make sure that like the when the directors make the movies, how their stuff works, and also uh, the actual files get to where they need to go. Like, if you can imagine how big, like, say, Avatar 2 is as an uncut movie. Yeah. And then uh, we don't just make one movie these days, we make like 18, 20 of them there because they have like different edits and that kind of thing for screenings and that kind of stuff. And uh, nowadays we even have. Uh, instead of doing the dailies there where they take uh, what they film that day so the executive can see it. Now they have live viewing in the cameras. So oh, wow. uh, uh, like your Kevin Feige can get us logged in to see what you're shooting at that moment. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, very high bandwidth uh, considerations. Obviously we're concerned about content security and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, we don't want uh, the adventure script leaking online if we can help it. <laughs> Understandable. And uh, yeah, so it's a uh, very typically tip of the spear kind of thing. There's a lot of, um, uh, usually it's more about uh, give us the fastest you got and let us know when you got something faster. And That's it's, cool. uh, it's a very different, I came from a consulting background, so um, I did a lot of consulting where like, you know, people would have to spend like five, or save for five years to upgrade their network and that kind of stuff. Oh. So a little bit different story. Nice. You know, for people looking to get to get into the field, you know, there's a bunch of different advice out there. You know, there's people telling you, hey, you gotta go get a four-year degree. There's people that say you need to go get certifications. 
you know, for you, what do you see is like the best path into the tech field in general? So personally, I don't even look at a candidate's education anymore when I interview people. Yeah. Actually, a funny story. One of the last people I hired, um, I uh, found out he had a doctorate in IT after I hired him when he had me on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so uh, I do uh, follow uh, those words. But um, what I find is that uh, education is good if you need help um, learning how to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, it is also good for certain fields in IT. Uh, Programming is the most common one because they have fully embraced certifications. Yeah. But for the most part, if you look at, say, an IT networking degree, what they're really teaching you over four years, whatever the number is, is basically maybe the CCNA, Medicad, and maybe like a Windows course and like a uh, history of Vietnam or something just for some culture. Like, um, so uh, it makes more sense to me to f uh, focus on someone who has like a CCNA and for like a junior role. And uh, then uh, at least I know, A, they're actually interested because they went above and beyond. Uh, yeah. Two, they at least know the topics that are in the CCNA. Uh, they can obviously know more, but, uh, uh, and it just kind of shows that, okay, these are someone who's investing in the future. If you take like a degree, maybe you uh, just took the degree just because you felt like it or, uh, <laughs> Maybe your friends helped you uh, pass there, and uh, you when we passed like the final exam, like it's uh, there's a lot of details, and a lot of students they'll like purge all the information they learned after the course there to focus on the next thing. So uh, I find certifications there. I mean, I have like a hundred certifications, so like uh, <laughs> I, I have to like them a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, when it comes to studying for these certifications, what is your favorite way to like? absorb the information are you a book learner or how do you how do you like it, it depends on what i'm learning yeah. uh so uh, if i'm new to a subject i'll try reading first uh i find i have the best um, retention then huh. and i have uh, a kind of mental tick kind of thing there where if i read a book on a subject i already know i have a hard time finishing it because i because like i know <laughs> uh, yeah it's like uh and it applies to like uh, literature too like uh, I still can't read The Lord of the Rings because I watched the movie <laughs> and I'm like okay I can't get through it <laughs> but, um, yeah. uh, so uh, if there's a book I'll probably read that first uh, depending on the subject there if there are courses such as say IME or um, uh, other uh, CBT nuggets or those kind of things yeah. then um, I'll usually get them a go uh, just to see what's doing there I like doing what I call passive learning where um I will uh, uh, put on like uh, the videos and then um, I'll uh, do something like else, like uh, play like a simple video game, like don't play like yeah. something that's gonna stress you out, but like, you know, uh, Hollow Knight or something there where there's not like a dialogue or anything and just kinda uh, just do that there until uh, the course is done. And what I find that gives you is um, it kind of solves some of the, uh, uh, when, you know, A to Z of uh, all the concepts so they get unpacked. A lot of times when you're doing it uh, just directly and uh, you're like, well, wait, that doesn't make sense. And it's because they haven't explained that to like the next chapter or right. what have you. You know, it's funny that you say that because I do the exact same thing. I thought it was like just a one-off thing. Like I almost always have something new like going on in the background, like whether it's, you know, like CBT Nuggets training or INE, like just playing passively in the background while I do my day-to-day -day job or um, sometimes I have a couple of podcasts I listen to that are talking about new technologies and stuff. I always kind of have that passive dialogue going on and, um, you know, and then like once I get something that like I really want to start diving into, at that point I can dive into it with a little bit more context, I feel like. Yeah, so uh, in that scenario, like I'll, uh, if there's something interesting that catches my attention, I'll stop, uh, pause and focus on it. And then after I'm done the passive learning, I'll usually go back and do like a deep, like, you know, pay attention. Nice. Uh, nice. Just to make sure I fill all the gaps there. But uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, at this point, I've done um, many, many certifications and that kind of thing. So uh, uh, I'm uh, very efficient at knowing uh, what I need to learn and um, that kind of thing there. Whereas if you're newer, it's uh, a little bit harder to, you have to see on the reels a little more. Absolutely. So a common trend I've noticed here at Cisco Live this year is the, the emergence of AI into everything. And uh, I, I think it goes without saying that AI is changing the landscape of technology right now. But how do you think like it's gonna 
play into like the job market in the coming years? Is it or re, is it going to start impacting jobs? You think, or is it going to like create new jobs? Well, I mean, IT are a fickle bunch. I'll put it that way. I've been in the industry um, probably like twenty years now, yeah. uh, and. Uh, I've seen, I remember when uh, Microsoft released uh, Windows Server 2003 and uh, that was going to be the end of the MCSE program because they made it so much easier than 2000. But, uh, why would you hire a system in anymore? And then it was cloud and then it was uh, so on automation and so on and so forth, the SDN. Like, uh, uh, I think a lot of people are waiting for the shoe to drop there because they uh, uh, maybe aren't secure in their uh, uh, job prospects. So they, uh, uh, they're like, I can't believe I'm getting a paycheck every week. <laughs> um, but uh, will AI change things? Eventually, yes. Um, will it be like a light switch and uh, no one in IT has a job anymore? No. Uh, but uh, I mean, IT, uh, everyone says it moves very quickly. And it does, but I say it's more like a slowly moving treadmill more than like, uh, you know, uh, you're sprinting all the time. Uh, so like, um, if you're like the guy who's racking uh, servers and installing like uh, Windows manually, uh, you probably should pay attention about this whole uh, virtualization thing they keep mentioning. Yeah. And uh, likewise, uh, like AI is going to be in the AI has been around for ten years in various forms, uh, and they haven't really solved a lot of problems that uh, AI has, which is you need good clean data and you need very specific parameters. Yeah. So we went from. Um, it uh, being very on the rails to, we took the rails off, but if you don't properly uh, define things, you got hallucinations and all that fun stuff there that uh, cause you a lot of grief. So you gotta make sure you're very focused on what you need to do. And like uh, Juniper is an excellent example because uh, they're arguably one of the first vendors to go to the AI uh, space when they bought NIST. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, it makes sense on wireless because uh, they can basically do all the uh, ARM stuff there to figure out the right wireless frequencies, all the stuff there. But on the wire, it's very basic. It's like, uh, hey, you might have a loop, uh, do something about it. Or like, uh, no one's attempting remediation, no one's trying that. Even if you look at like Cattle Center, it's the same kind of thing there where it might tell you, hey, you might have a problem with uh, the ICE server, but it's still just kind of like uh, offering you a data point. Will we get to a point where it's going to auto uh, remediate? Probably, but. Uh, you're going to find a bunch of very localized AIs, I think, is where we're going to go there. Like, there'll be switch AI, there'll be uh, router AI, possibly, right. there'll be uh, um, whatever. And um, it's, uh, they're going to be a bunch of isolation or um, isolated instances. But uh, that's the other thing, too, is uh, I don't know if you remember when voice came out, uh, but um, it was a very. Um, this word. Uh, basically, uh, Cisco uh, got into voice there to sell switches. Uh, and it's essentially the same thing with the AI there, except for now we're talking like 800 gig switches and Infinity Band <laughs> and uh, servers that uh, cost more than your house. And, nice. uh, so uh, as an architect, it's very interesting because um, usually when I say I want to build like custom switches uh, that have like 800 gig uplinks and whatnot, you're, you, you have like a five or 10 year ROI. Yeah. Uh, return on investment. And uh, basically you buy that and you're using that for 10 years uh, before you think upgrade again. With AI, you're like one, maybe two years at most uh, for an AI because uh, it's rapidly developing. Uh, you could build for an 800 gig uh, data center, which is basically what we need to support the uh, internal AI stuff right now. And then uh, the NVIDIA can say, by the way, uh, the new version's out and you need 1.6 terabytes. And, uh, or they can go the other way and say, we made this so much more efficient, guys. One gig uh, links is all you need. And so uh, it's a little bit risky. Uh, business have to be very serious about uh, wanting to write off uh, a couple million dollars to play with this early. Yeah. And uh, so I think it'll be like a lot of things. like. Uh, like cloud, for example, like uh, it looks ubiquitous to us, uh, but there's plenty of companies that are, don't have cloud, don't need cloud, don't want it. Like it's uh, and uh, just because all the cool stuff there is um, available doesn't mean everyone's using it there. Like uh, uh, I do a lot of uh, SRE DevOps stuff there, but there's probably only like five percent of the companies out there that are actually like SRE ready. Uh, most people that are if you write a Python script, they're like, whoa, that's black magic, right? So, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I don't think we're uh, going to worry about it. I mean, uh, I think you'll see other industries be impacted before uh, a lot of general IT, like uh, fast food is the obvious one with uh, like the economy right now and that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, eventually you'll get things like uh, if uh, the government starts um, saying that, hey, you know what, we're going to use... Uh, uh, AI for accounting and that kind of stuff. Like, uh, I think those kind of industries will bleed out. Uh, maybe like help desk and whatnot will eventually dry up, but uh, yeah. there's always going to be the upper architect kind of people. And if not, then well, uh, like if I lose my job, then it's uh, probably impacted a lot of other people. Un understandable, understandable. You know, what, what I tell everyone is AI, I think, should be viewed as a tool. You know, those who are going to be successful are going to use leverage AI to advance their careers, to make themselves work better, and the people that are worried about it replacing their jobs and like not doing anything about it are the ones that are going to get left in the dust. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why Cisco added AI to the new CCNA, right? Yeah. So, like, uh, uh, yeah, I think if you're aware of it there, I mean, uh, I think uh, you'll find, like, 90% of people will be a consumer of AI, and very few people will be, like, the actual implementers of it. And... Uh, when it is there, they'll have like a catalyst center with uh, AI edition or something like that that you buy. And yeah. It just is incidentally there. Understandable. Um, as we start to land the plane here, sure. if you could give just one piece of advice to someone who is like looking to get that first job in the tech field, what would that piece be? Uh, don't forget the networking and networking. No. Uh, so uh, uh, make sure you build out like your LinkedIn or whatnot and start adding people in if they don't even know them like uh, uh, like start adding recruiters uh, you know add um, people like uh, Dakota or myself on LinkedIn because uh, one uh, you know you exist then and two is uh, uh, you see into our network and vice versa there so uh, if I say uh, I need uh, some kind of person there maybe you'll fit those requirements uh, also joined online communities so uh, I run a number of discords uh, like uh, Jeremy's IT lab, David Bombo and such, and um, uh, my own Cisco study group. And uh, uh, if, by making those connections, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we'll reach out to people directly and just say, hey, uh, I know you from Discord. Uh, uh, this might be a good fit or that kind of thing. So uh, try and uh, skip the line if you can. Otherwise, uh, remember that um, an entry-level job is kind of like a lottery because the candidate essentially has a blank piece of paper with maybe a CCNA on it from a uh, hiring perspective. You're not putting a lot of thought into it. Yeah. Uh, so um, try to uh, just keep in mind that you're going to be applying a lot. Uh, if you can, try to uh, play the keyword game. So uh, a lot of people will say, uh, yeah, I did a job, I worked on routers. You know, you should say that... Yeah, in my job, I worked on a Cisco 4031 router, and, uh, or 4431. I also worked on a Cisco, like, uh, make sure you're typing Cisco over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and what that's going to do is uh, when the HR system uh, ranks the uh, things there, it's going to say, hey, you're a little bit higher because you match more of the keywords. Nice. Uh, so if you can uh, try and do that, I mean, uh, don't, uh, if you can't do it, don't uh, push it there because uh, Eventually, someone's going to look at your resume and realize, okay, what's going on here? But, uh, uh, but yeah, try. That's a decent hack. Uh, otherwise, yeah, just try and reach out to uh, uh, people uh, directly. Uh, recruiters, uh, they make money off you, so uh, they uh, they're always happy to make connections. And otherwise, uh, try and get your CCNA right away. It's the best um, de facto cert for IT for pretty much any junior position awesome. even if they don't list it or list it they usually respect it well if people want to connect with you reach out and say ask you questions where can they find you uh so you can add me on uh linkedin you can search for my name donald rob or the pack and thrower awesome. um also frequently on i and e uh, and uh various discords uh such as uh where am i uh cisco study group i'm on uh jeremy's it lab a lot Ava Bombal, uh, Network Chuck. Nice. So you I can find me if you want to find me. I appreciate you taking the time and sharing all this great advice with us. Yeah, I'll catch up. Absolutely. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time, keep learning.